again, I would like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Brooks and the uh, uh, organizing committee for allowing me to come and, come and speak today. Um, actually, I'm never sure why I quite say that because I really don't like being up here, so I'm really not very thankful, but anyway, thank you anyway. <laughs> um, and I guess my talk should be started out by saying ditto and I could s sit down because I think uh, what uh, was just spoken, if you could listen carefully to what she said, are extremely important. This last week, just before coming here, I was operating on a pregnant patient. I asked my resident, what trimester should we operate on this patient? And she answered, the second trimester. I said, where did you get that from? We pulled up the SCORE curriculum, and it's 10 years behind on that chapter. And the things that she talked about actually um, are different from what is currently in the SCORE chapter in the current edition right now. And, and the things that we're talking about are really, over the last, really, since 2007, a real change in the way we take care of the pregnant patient. I'll be actually reviewing, and I told uh, Dr. Brooks ahead of time, I think I'll be saying many of the same things. He says repetition is good, so I'm glad to see many of you people walking in during the part of our talk. We can hear about it again. <clears throat> I have no disclosures, except uh, for one thing that I do seem to know a little bit about pregnancy. Um, <clears throat> when faced with a surgical problem, uh, what, what really happens is we, we stand back and we ask, well, who should we be operating on? And if we do, when should we be operating? Uh, as we began to write the guidelines, we sat down and wrote the questions we had in our minds that we needed to answer. And we asked, well, preoperative, what, what about the imaging? What kind of imaging safe? Are there pitfalls that we can get into with that? Because my emergency room, every time a pregnant patient comes in, it's a big battle to get the appropriate test. Perioperative, what kind of um, things can you use and should you use? Tocolytics, should you use them uh, all the time? Fetal monitoring, what kind of port placement? What level of pneumoperitoneum? Uh, the answers to these questions are different from the initial guidelines that were written back in the, uh, the 1990s, and it was based on different information. So many people say, well, where do I get this information? And some people say, nurse, get on the internet. Go to surgery.com, scroll down, click on an Are You Totally Lost icon. And what I would recommend is actually you go to sages.org, scroll down, and click on the guidelines icon because there's a lot of information there that is very beneficial, not only for you, but for your administrators, for your anesthesiologists, for your emergency room doctors, to help create a program to take care of the emergency uh, of the uh, uh, pregnant patient. As mentioned, there are the guidelines in 2011, we now use 185 references and 23 guidelines have come from this. And we have used the grade system. Do not really need to read the slide, except that there are four areas of quality evidence uh, that we use. And then there are two levels of recommendations, both a strong and a weak. And we've, we've heard about guideline number eight, but it's important to reinforce this. If we can stand back and think about how we take care of the pregnant, pregnant patient, we can avoid most of the pitfalls. Because if we can take care of the mother, baby will do well. And they can have less post after pain. And the picture on the left, obviously a pregnant patient. The picture on the right is a Yumbayar, and with her permission, we uh, were able to go out, videotape, uh, film her family. This is her four days post-op in Mongolia, and she was able to milk her cows, ma make her milk tea, uh, take care of her family, and she has actually you know, much faster return to the work that she needs to do. It's extremely important around the world, even for non-pregnant patients and pregnant. Um, this is the big issue, uh, or one of the big issues. When do we operate? And we've said we can do it in any trimester. Well, how do we know that? Um, people are concerned during that first trimester. You know, what's the abortion rate? We've had, with open data, 12% of people well, had preterm uh, had abortion rate. In the open data, we had a preterm delivery rate of about 40% in the third term. However, in studies that have been done since then, these kinds of numbers have not been reported or found. And so that it actually, it is, it, we do not have the same type of preterm delivery and abortion rates doing it laparoscopically. And I think a big part of that is because of the non-touch of the uterus and not having the abdomen open to the air. Um, Long-term effects on the children. This is my handicapped daughter. It's not from surgery, but I asked her with her permission and my wife to use this. Is to, just to reinforce that we're concerned. Is there going to be some long-term effect that we don't know about? And we do not have much data on that. There's only about one study that I know of that had eight children with one to eight year follow-up post-op that showed no difference, but that's a very small study. Um, and so that being able to use surgery for pregnant patients can be done in all three trimesters very safely, if it is uh, necessary. How do we evaluate the pregnant patient? Now, guideline number one, 
This has a moderate and a strong recommendation. Ultrasound imaging during pregnancy is safe, useful in identifying the etiology of acute abdominal pain in the pregnant patient. And this, this radiographic test is probably great for all the gynecological causes, uh, causes of abdominal pain, but is also useful for first-line diagnostic studies for many non-GYN causes. As many of us know, it's not very accurate in some areas, and so there are other diagnostic tests that we may want to utilize. And this is where sometimes we begin to struggle. Do we use CT scan? Do we use MRI? But what's the data behind it, and can we avoid the pitfalls of getting into that? Is it safe? Guideline number two is expeditious and accurate diagnosis should take precedence over concerns for ionizing radiation. <clears throat> radiation doses should be limited to five to 10 rads in the first 25 weeks of pregnancy. I would dare say, before doing this, I had no idea, actually I heard about a RAD, but I didn't have any idea how much a RAD was for any test that we were using for our patients. But what I did find out that if you use less than five RADs, the fetal injury or risk is minimal. There's not long, there's really no significant injury to that. But what people are concerned about is if you use radiation during the uh, first week, you might lose the baby. 10 to 17 weeks, uh, you may have some CNS teratogenicity, such as this child or later in pregnancy, some hematologic cancer, and there may be some truth with large numbers finding a very small risk for a hematologic cancer for larger doses of radiation. When you look at how much each of these tests use, even when you get down to a CT scan of the pelvis, at most is about 2.2 rads, still well below the, the minimum risk for one test during pregnancy. We certainly don't want to be radiating all our patients, but it's important to understand that it is a relatively safe uh, uh, study. Now, CT, or, um, so, uh, CT scanning protocols deliver a radiation dose to the fetus below detrimental levels and may be considered as an appropriate test during pregnancy depending on the clinical situation. But we need to understand in our own CT scanners how much radiation that is, work with our doctors and radi radiation colleagues to, to be able to make sure that the test is done appropriately. But MR is now becoming more important. We have only a really small amount of this in the current guideline. I recommended in the guidelines committee the other day that we reevaluate this and maybe even come up with a new protocol in facilities that do have MR scanning. We're beginning a plan to maybe have MR be our first test and some of our, our second test in evaluating abdominal pain. The National Radiologic Protection Board, however, states that they should avoid MR in the first trimester. But as you look at much of the data, there's, no, there's just no data. There's no information saying that it's bad. And so many places are still recommending that in cases of emergencies that we use MR scanning as a very good test, that it's actually the risk of that, it's much less risky than not using the test. So we have that MR uh, imaging without the use of, of intravenous gadolinium can be performed at any stage of pregnancy. Tocolytics is the only one that we have a high and strong recommendation. It is one that uh, it's pretty well documented that you do not need to use this prophylactically, but in cases where people are having preterm uh, contractions, it is very helpful. And there have been lawsuits that have been used uh, and, and successfully um, argued when they have not been used. So it's important to use them when they are needed, but they are not needed prophylactically. How about fetal heart monitoring? You know, when we first started this years ago, people said you had to monitor the baby's heart tones during pregnancy. And I think you can know, avoid some of the pitfalls if you realize it's impossible to do that. No, it's not impossible. You can do transvaginal evaluations. There were recommendations of fetal scalp monitoring. That's very invasive. But we, we have recommended that there's, because there's no interoperative problems by doing what we've recommended is monitor the heart of the baby preoperatively, do the case, and then check the baby postoperatively. Where do you put your, put your first port? The initial access can be safely accomplished with many different techniques. I asked my resident a week ago, how should we do this? She said, let's use a Hassan technique. We have to do it that way. Actually, in the studies that we performed, using the Hassan technique nearly reached statistical significance for early preterm delivery. And so we have actually, in surveying the literature, there's information on doing it the way that you know how to do it safely. So we recommend either using Hassan uh, optical uh, technique or a various needle technique. However, we obviously need to keep in mind where that uterus is and in what part of gestation that the baby is. Now in our additional access, 
when we looked at laparoscopic cholecystectomy and apodectomy in our facility, we found for laparoscopic cholecystectomy, 56% of people still used a Varys needle in the third trimester, whereas for a lap apia, it was only about 50%. But in all three areas was done with equal safety. As you put your first uh, uh, Varys needle or trocar, yeah, obviously, where the size of the baby is, is, is uh, of the, uh, the uterus is extremely important. To avoid injury to the uterus and damage to the fetus, obviously need to move that trocar to different areas. So the, the Varys needle, when I first put it in, as somebody who's early pregnant, put it just above the umbilicus in the second trimester, up in the right upper quadrant, and in the third trimester, in the high right upper quadrant. And then I would put the other trocars appropriately under direct vision. CO2 insufflation. We need to be able to visualize the, uh, the, uh, what we are doing. And there used to be a, a comment that we should only use 10 to 12 millimeters of pressure. We actually, in surveying the literature, find people are doing it with 15 millimeters and doing it just safely. And you have to balance uh, the ability to be able to see with the, uh, the physiology of the, the mother. Also, the question is, what about acidosis in, in, in the fetus? Well, as we look at that, we all know that during uh, pregnancy, the growing fetus puts pressure up on the diaphragm, and that leads over to re decrease residual volume and decrease functional residual capacity in the mother. And then we also have a decreased PaO2, and then we get concerned or we, uh, uh, about the mother, but pressures of 15 millimeters of mercury have no increased adverse effects and outcomes to the patient and the fetus during laparoscopic during pregnancy. Now, <clears throat> One of the studies used, John Hunter did uh, years ago, excellent study, looking at fetal acidosis, and it was done on four sheep. And that showed an increase of, of acidosis in the placental circulation. The question is, does that translate over into any type of clinical significance? So with CO2 pneumoperitoneum, we do get acidosis. We might get a little mild tachycardia. We're worried about hypertension, hypercapnia. But there is absolutely no evidence to support long-term detrimental effects resulting from CO2 pneumoperitoneum in humans. But to be able to monitor that safely, we then are able to figure out how do we monitor the CO2 in the mother and in the fetus. And again, people were wondering about putting in A-lines, and this was an early recommendation, fetal scalp monitoring of pH, very invasive techniques. However, there is great correlation between the maternal arterial blood gas and end tidal CO2. So cabnography adequately reflects maternal acid-base status in humans and should be monitored very closely throughout the case and, and changes in the ventilation done according to that uh, information. Um, to avoid pitfalls and to then proceed with whatever type of surgery you do, using these guidelines can help guide you to avoid common mistakes. Avoid the mistakes of injuring the uterus. Avoid the mistakes of using too much pneumoperitoneum. Avoid the mistakes of not having enough visualization and causing injury because you can't see what you're doing. Take care of the patient appropriately like we have with, uh, with a non-pregnant patient. This has helped us in going over. We had two patients that had uh, severe ulcerative colitis. One was 12 weeks pregnant, one was 22 weeks pregnant. They uh, came to us when they were being transfused multiple units of blood every week. They were on TPN. They were losing weight. They were going to lose their babies. And we were able to use, using the guidelines that we had come up with, able to go in and do laparoscopic abdominal total colectomies with end ileostomy. You can see the uterus in the uh, picture in the right upper corner with the, to the left of there with the colostomy coming up from the side. You can see in the left upper part, uh, part there that that's the colostomy or the colon being divided with the uterus just to the right, no touch technique. And both of these patients were able to be able to document the increase in their uh, uh, nutrition, their weight gain. They didn't need transfusions any longer. They were able to go on and have healthy babies and then come back later and have their uh, J pouch reconstruction done. So. Thank you very much and appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much, Ray.